Hello and welcome to the sixth lecture for ACS 210. Today we'll be talking about um, Buddhism and I'll be discussing major Buddhist ideas uh, in relation to the readings that I ask you to do for this week. So I ask you to read several short Buddhist texts. Most of these are fairly old um, and were composed in the centuries uh, following the Buddha's death. So the Buddha, the historical Buddha Siddhartha Gautama is said to have lived in the 5th century. So most of our readings for this week uh, are texts that were composed in the 3rd century with the exception of the Heart Sutra which is a turn of the era, so roughly in the year, in the 1st century of the Common Era uh, text. And it presents a uh, version of Buddhist teachings which in many ways deviates from the early Buddhist. Um, I'll return to that point later. But as I say, most of the readings that I ask you to do, the Sunadanda Sunta, about the qualities of the Brahman, the excerpt from the Mahavagga, which tells us about the self, um, the Chula Malunkyavada Sutta, as well as the Sutta Nipata poems, are from the earliest strands of uh, Buddhism. So those are the texts that I'll be relying on in discussing major Buddhist ideas. Um, before I go further, I want to share with you something that you didn't read, but that I want to um, impart in my lecture. And this is central to most uh, Buddhist traditions. It's the story or the legend of how the Buddha became an enlightened person, how the Buddha attained um, what his followers regard as a transcendent form of wisdom that allows to cut through the delusions and vices of ordinary life and to attain to a state of supreme peace and serenity, a state, as you might know, which is known as nirvana. The legend is also about how and why the Buddha started to teach because it's one thing to attain nirvana for oneself, and it's another to start instructing others about how that can be attained. Because a key idea in Buddhism is that all people have the potential of attaining supreme insight, regardless of birth, regardless of gender, regardless of social class or background. All persons have this potential of cutting through delusion and attaining supreme wisdom. Now, by the end of this lecture, my hope is that you'll have a slightly clearer idea of what this wisdom involves. So the legend or the story of the Buddha to begin then. Um, the Buddha, let's actually call him by, so Buddha is a title which was given to him after enlightenment. It literally, it literally means the awakened one, right? He who is awakened or woke though not in the contemporary sense of the term. Um, so let's call him by the name Siddhartha Gautama, which was his historic, which was his, his proper name um, before he was given the title of Buddha. So Siddhartha Gautama is said to have been born in a powerful Kshatriya family. So he belonged to the second caste in the Brahmanical system. Um, he was the son of a king, of the king of one of the small kingdoms which... Uh, covered most of the territory of northern or contemporary northern India. Um, and at his birth, um, as was standard when a, a prince was born, he was the firstborn, um, his parents had the visit or, or received the visit of, uh, of an oracle, uh, of a sort of wise person capable of telling the future. And the oracle said, well, your son here, Siddhartha Gautama, will either be a great ruler of men and extend the power of this house, of this family, uh, very broadly and sort of become a kind of world conqueror, as it were, world emperor. Um, or he will renounce this world, he will withdraw from ordinary society, and he will become another kind of world emperor, a spiritual world emperor, as it were, in a, in a highly a great sage who will inspire uh, the multitudes to uh, the attainment of, of insight and wisdom and and a transcendence of, of suffering. 
Now, being aristocrats and desiring their child to continue in the footsteps of the family, um, Siddhartha Gautama's father thought that the first option of his son becoming a world emperor, a worldly world emperor, was preferable to the second. Uh, and he tried to do everything to prevent his son from being confronted to the realities uh, and the suffering of the world uh, on, the, you know, on the assumption that if his son were to become aware of the precarity, impermanence, and per pervasive suffering of the world, this would prompt him to abandon the palace and become a uh, transcendence-seeking shramana or wanderer or renouncer. Um, so he tried to create this very artificial environment in which uh, the young Siddhartha Gautama encountered only pleasures and beauty uh, and had no sight of decay or suffering. So anyone sick, anyone older would be chased from the palace grounds and Siddhartha Gautama was sort of presented only with sort of a, a, a universe of pleasure and beauty and youth and all these things. Um, so the idea was to prevent Siddhartha Gautama from becoming aware of the realities of suffering, illness, aging, death, and so on. Um, so the story continues that towards the, you know, some, at some point in his early 20s, Siddhartha Gautama becomes curious about what's outside the palace walls because he's sort of lived in this kind of enclave, right? This walled-in sort of artificial paradise, as it were, and he becomes desirous of seeing what is happening outside of this. And so he eventually leaves the palace and goes out into the world. And the story is that on his first outing, um, he saw uh, a very aged person for the first time. And he was struck and, and, and really worried about this. And it really it sort of troubled him very deeply. He wasn't even aware of the reality of aging. That's the story. And on his second outing, he sees um, a sick person and he becomes aware of the reality of illness. And on his third outing, he sees a, a, a cadaver. So he sees a dead person, a corpse, and becomes aware of the reality of death. And finally, on the fourth outing, he sees a shramana, he sees a renouncer. He sees someone who's cut off their hair, their beard, who is adorned simply with a robe, who um, obtains food by through begging, and who is entirely devoted to the spiritual life. And he thinks, that's what I want to do. That's what I need to do. This world of pleasures and beauty and youth is actually ephemeral. It's impermanent. It's It doesn't last. And it all ends with aging illness and death and that creates and that for him created a sense of, of deep anxiety and and, and 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 a sort of existential crisis of sorts and he thinks i need to sort of relinquish this palace life and figure out that truth that knowledge which will set me free and perhaps others free uh, from this cycle of birth and death from the cycle of suffering a kind of transcendence of this world towards some supreme state where one would be protected, as it were, from the anguish and from the suffering associated to birth, death, um, illness, age, and so on. Um, and so ultimately, the oracle was right. Um, the Buddha sort of does not become a world conqueror, or the Siddhartha Gautama avoids that course and instead goes into the forest and after a period of experimentation with different teachers with different teachings with different sorts of practices is said to have finally attained insight on his own by sitting under this tree and meditating now one of the things that happens in the period before is that he experiments with extreme forms of asceticism so he works with certain masters who prone who who uh, encourage um, not eating, not sleeping, um, extreme self-control, extreme ascetic practices. And Siddhartha Gautama realizes that this is too much. This is, this is one extreme, an extreme of asceticism, 
is actually no better than the extreme of an unconscious life of worldly pleasures. And he realizes that the path to wisdom lies somewhere in the middle of, two, of these two things, a kind of middle path, avoiding the extreme of asceticism, self-laceration, self-violence, essentially. The Jains, from a Buddhist perspective, go too far in that direction. Um, and also avoiding a life given only, given over to pleasures only, a kind of middle path between these things is what is required. Now, the Buddha's great insights are said to have concerned suffering, its cause, and the way to end suffering, the way to put an end to that cause of suffering, as well as the means of uh, putting an end to suffering. As we'll see, his insight, the insight that led him to become the Buddha or the awakened one, also concerned realizations concerning the nature.